four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Legal Education Talk Series, a program by Indonesia Education Network in collaboration with LEAP OKP, a joint project by the Faculty of Law uh, Universitas Erlangga and the Faculty of Law Maastricht University. This program is also in collaboration with five law schools in Indonesia, Universitas Mulawarman, Universitas Haluoleo, Universitas Trunojoyo Madura, Universitas Nusa Cendana, and Universitas Borneo Tarakan. Uh, it is a pleasure that today we are here in this virtual Zoom meeting. Um, we are uh, here with the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Marce de Visser, oh. Dr. Uh. as the Associate Dean of Singapore Management University, Dr. Klaesens from the Faculty of Law, Master University, and also the uh, director of LEAP OKP Uni Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Radian, director LEAP OKP Maastricht side, Professor Heringa, uh, the deans of the law school Universitas Mulawarman, Universitas Haluleo, Universitas Trunojoyo Madura, Universitas Nusa Cendana, and Universitas Borneo Tarakan. We also have program coordinator LIP OKP Universitas Erlangga, Dr. Rosa uh, Ristawati, and the Faculty of Law Mastery from the Faculty of Law Mastery, Dr. Shasha. Um, here today, um, the speaker of uh, today's talk series, uh, there are three speakers. The first is uh, Dr. Short Klaesens and uh, Dr. Marce de Fisser and uh, Dr. Nurul Bariza. Before um, I begin with uh, the uh, event, I would like to read a short biography of uh, the three speakers. The first one is Dr. Short Klaesens. Dr. Short Klaesens is a senior lecturer in European Law at the Faculty of Law of Maastricht University. He teaches and coordinates international and European law and EU substantive law. From 2010 to 2013, uh, he was a member of the faculty board as well as the associate dean for English talk programs. Up until 2017, he was a member of the board of the combined law curriculum of Hasselt University, the Catholic University of Leuven, and Maastricht University, as well as Hasselt coordinator at the faculty of law in Maastricht. And currently, uh, he is uh, the director of studies for the Faculty of Law Mastery University. Uh, Dr. Klaesens is also a member of the Mastery Center of European Law and a member of the EU's Community Research School. What a comprehensive uh, uh, CV. Uh, the second speaker is Dr. Marce de Fisser. She is currently the Associate Dean, Postgraduate Teaching and Curriculum uh, at the School of Law, Singapore Management University from July 2017 up to present. And she is also the Director of JD Program, Singapore Management University. And uh, she taught in Singapore Management University, the comparative legal systems, constitutions, cultures, and contexts. Her research areas or the, uh, her research interests are engagement with constitutional rules and values outside the courtroom, constitutional courts, transnational judicial dialogues, comparative pedagogy and methodology, and she is currently involved in uh, projects 
such as framework for extrajudicial constitutional interpretation, participatory constitution making in small states, and cultivating constitutional literacy and identity. And the third speaker, our third speaker is Ibu Nurul Barizah, PhD. She is the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Erlanga from 2019 until present. Previously, she was the Vice Dean for Academic uh, and Students Affairs at the Faculty of Law, Universitas Erlanga. And she involved in, very, in various uh, projects with the government and she was the uh, part of the General Election Commission of the Republic of Indonesia uh, in 2000, between 2014 and 2015. And up until now, she is a member of Appeal Commission of Plan Varieties Protection Office at the Ministry of Agriculture of the Republic of Indonesia. Her research interest is particularly intellectual property rights and the WTO law. Well, uh, those are, uh, these are the uh, curriculum vitae of our presenters today. And um, this talk, uh, I would like to invite the uh, director of LEAP OKP project, uh, Universitas Airlangga site, Dr. Uh, Radian Salman, to give an opening remark for this event. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Nilam, uh, for chairing uh, this online discussion. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Bapak Ibu, uh, and distinguished guests. Uh, thank you for joining our seminar. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you. We are honored to have our three speakers, Dr. Klesen, uh, Dr. Marjorie Fisher, and also uh, Dean Faculty of Law, Universitas Airlangga. Uh, we expect to hear from them about their experience. Also, of course, there's their knowledge, their expertise uh, in their law school on how to deal with nowadays uh, digital learning. As we know that uh, our legal education, that we are now a facing challenge uh, with this pandemic situation. Now, suddenly everything uh, is by online. Uh, and I think the situation in Indonesia is quite, uh, quite different because we have problem with a uh, gap of educational infrastructure. We have problem also with the gap of uh, telecommunication infrastructure. So uh, now when everything is by online, then of course we are facing problem and also a challenge. Most of our, uh, most of our law school have to conduct their teaching activities by online. However, not only challenges, but I'm sure that uh, there are many advantages uh, we can uh, get from this situation. Uh, this of course, as a uh, legal education institution, I think, uh, this digital on online teaching process will affect uh, will affect to the uh, let's say uh, quality or standard of uh, our graduate students. So uh, this is the point of uh, I think we will discuss uh, in this online discussion. But uh, before uh, before we start, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly. Uh, introduce about this Indonesian uh, legal education network. And then uh, at the end, I think uh, in the before opening remark, uh, my collaborative colleague in this program, Professor Awi Heringa, will explain briefly about uh, the program. Uh, you can see here that now, uh, you can see in the screen, I think, uh, now we are here uh, in this program. Uh, this is a, what we call as a, a 
Legal Education Talk Series. Ya. And we are here now uh, about the digital learning challenge for uh, legal education. Uh, legal education, Indonesian Legal Education Network uh, is our initiative. This is initiative from uh, six law school uh, in this program. And I would like to quote how important this networking of legal education. Jadi Bapak Ibu, I have to use in bahasa. Jadi Bapak Ibu, kami menginisiasi enam fakultas hukum uh, untuk membuat sesuatu jejaring yang kita sebut sebagai jaringan pendidikan hukum Indonesia, Indonesian Legal Education Network. Apa pentingnya? Ini adalah gagasan nantinya ke depan share new great ideas, perspective and information. Dan itu secara kolaboratif dan saya kira itu akan meningkatkan kualitas dan standar bagi penyelenggaraan pendidikan hukum di Indonesia. Dan impact-nya bukan sebagai tujuan utama, tapi impact-nya adalah pengakuan uh, institusi uh, pendidikan hukum kita secara nasional dan uh, internasional. Nah ini satu hal yang penting yang uh, apa? menjadi gagasan dari kami di enam fakultas yang tentu akan kami sangat terbuka dengan joining dari Bapak Ibu sekalian dari fakultas lain. As a, info, as a information next, we will have a legal education talk series also. For the next agenda, we will have a student voice. The first uh, issue is about before graduation. Are you ready for profession? So we will invite uh, some students from Mastery also, UNER, of course, UITM, UNIZA, Malaysia. And here we have Dr. Marcha, and I think uh, we can ask uh, Dr. Marcha, uh, her students, to uh, as one of the speaker here. And the next, uh, at the national level, we will have also discussion about the curriculum. Uh, autonomy of the campus and uh, job market, yeah? curriculum kampus merdeka dan dunia kerja from the perspective of the uh, law school uh, students. Uh, for information about LIP OKP, uh, you may visit and follow us, and I will share this information uh, in the chat. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to. Uh, Once again, as a director of Lip OKP Project Site owner together with Professor Awi Heringa, as director of Lip OKP Project uh, Mastery, Dr. Shasha Hart and Dr. Rosaris Tawati as a program coordinator, uh, would like to thank you for your participation in this seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Bapak Radian Salman, uh, for the opening remarks. Now, um, Bapak Ibu sekalian, I would like to remind you if you are not comfortable asking questions, for example, in English, you can always uh, give, uh, share your questions at the chat box of this Zoom meeting. Uh, in Bahasa Indonesia, and then on the question and answer sessions, uh, I will translate the questions uh, for you uh, to the uh, speakers. So uh, do not hesitate to uh, ask questions either in Bahasa Indonesia or in English. Now, uh, this event is very important marking the importance of the uh, digital learning, especially in uh, the, the legal education that we are currently in uh, pandemic situations where we cannot go to university, that we cannot go to court uh, for practice. And this needs uh, uh, digital Uh, infrastructure for for law students to study. Uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian, as Bapak Radian Salman already mentioned that there is a digital divide 
occurs in Indonesia. The infrastructure of the digital uh, infrastructure is not uh, spreading equally in uh, parts of Indonesia. Uh, today, we have three speakers that will discuss uh, the importance of uh, digital uh, legal educations. For the first speaker, I would like to invite a Dr. Marcia to give the presentations. Dr. Marcia, I will assist you in sharing the presentation slide. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, That's okay. Okay. So now everybody can see the uh, screen, right? Well, I can, and I, I, I hope that the same is true for, for everyone yeah. else. Yeah. So let me start by thanking you for inviting me to join this panel. Uh, quite clearly, it's very timely, very topical to talk about questions of online learning. Um, we could say that COVID has made this particularly acute, but arguably, even without the ongoing pandemic, we're slowly moving in a direction where online teaching becomes important. Um, clearly not uh, as a substitute for the face-to-face -face classes, but preferably as something that will augment the experience that we have when we're once again able to come to university. Now, I thought that what uh, might be helpful in my opening remarks is to squarely address that question of infrastructure that was mentioned uh, before. So digital infrastructure, um, questions of a digital divide, and what this may mean from um, a university perspective. So for those of you who are not uh, or not yet familiar with SMU, let me perhaps share a little bit because I hope that will give an understanding of the environment in which SMU has dealt with um, the ongoing challenge of um, well, online teaching. So SMU is a pretty small university. It's a specialized university located in the heart of Singapore. Um, it has six different schools. Um, we have a school of business, economics, accounting, information systems, social sciences, and law. So you get a sense of the areas that we focus on. It's very, if you want, social science related. We have about 10,000 undergraduate and postgraduate students, um, and they include a fair number of Singaporeans. But for undergraduate and particularly postgraduate programs, we have a number of foreign students as well. Some coming from the wider ASEAN region and some coming, if you want, as far away as uh, Europe, Canada or Latin America. So that's if you want another consideration to bear in mind when teaching online. Now, when SMU was set up, one of the core pillars that um, the university is, is built on is to have innovative learning experiences. And that comes across in, in a range of activities that are by now being made compulsory for students. So to start with, all our students are exposed to multidisciplinary learning. They have to take courses outside the law. Um, then secondly, um, we offer experiential projects where students take courses with students from other schools, where they address questions that have been brought up by our industry partners. This is if you want you're not your typical classroom teaching. It's done very organically, very project based. And you can straight away see that when the pandemic hit Singapore, this was one of the challenging courses to transition from an offline to an online environment. Now, the same goes for the other part of the SMU general curriculum, which is global exposure. So the intention is that 100% of our undergraduate students go abroad at some point during their four years. Now, again, given that borders are closed, this too required quite some creativity on all our parts to find new ways in which students are able to do this. Okay, can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you very much. So in terms of the pedagogy at SMU, we do seminar style teaching. So there are no lectures, no tutorials. All our classes are taught in a seminar style where we have 
typically about 45 students at most. And you can see on the picture, this is what the classroom looks like. So it's very much designed for interactive learning based on the Socratic method. Now, in addition, the pedagogy is premised on uh, what we call holistic and continuous assessment. That means that for students, it's not just enough to do their readings and study for a final exam. They are expected to participate in class and um, they are graded on that basis. They have to complete group projects and they need to do midterms, write research papers, etc. Now, again, you will understand this creates challenges when you transition from an offline to an online environment. Now, during the Q&A, I'd be um, more than, than happy to uh, discuss some of the solutions that have been put in place and some of the uh, practices that may perhaps be of interest to adopt elsewhere as well. But I thought for now, and to come back to the point about infrastructure, let me um, here start with a plea to have university-wide institutionalization of educational support for online teaching, but preferably for offline as well. So I understand that we have with us in the audience today a number of deans at law schools. So, so perhaps um, it's good for me to start by the rationales for having a university-wide approach that, 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 that expands beyond, if you want, just a law school. Now, first of all, doing that means that uh, there is an important signaling function. It communicates to students and instructors both those currently with the university or with the law school, as well as those thinking of joining your university, that the university and the law school think that online learning and learning in general is something that is vitally important. Now, secondly, and that perhaps also already speaks a little bit to the question of infrastructure and the digital divide, having university-wide offices that can provide support allows you to realize economies of scale rather than having every school try to figure out for themselves how they can best equip their instructors and their students to engage in online learning. And that brings me to the final rationale, which is that what we have noticed at SMU is that the different schools, because they have their own disciplines, their own way in teaching content, if we all collaborate within a university-wide unit, it allows for cross-disciplinary uh, sharing of good practices, and it may prompt um, innovative ideas. So for instance, one good example here is that our School of Information Systems has often used games to teach content to students. So this is something that is called gamification. When some of my colleagues in the law faculty who like to basically play games in their spare time heard about this, they were interested but weren't quite sure how they could implement that for a course like tort law, for instance. Because they then were able to sit down with their colleagues from information systems, they were as a result able to actually create a, a game that is now being implemented in our tort law class. So that allows students to learn some of the principles with the help of their laptops. Okay, I will move on to the next slide. So um, I think here what is important is, is if you want, there's, there's two things that need to be done. The first is that instructors and students need to have the right mindset about online learning. Now, before the pandemic started, what we noticed um, in SMU in general, but definitely within the School of Law, is that a lot of our colleagues used to grumble a little bit about online teaching. It was one of those things that was never going to be quite necessary. It was never going to be that good anyway. So why bother? And students similarly had a very negative view of this. Now, quite clearly, if you have such a view, it's difficult to get people um, animated, uh, interested in online learning, especially when we bear in mind that in online learning, we miss oftentimes the vital visual clues that you have when you're in the classroom, where you see, are my students still there? Are they listening? Are they understanding? So what can be done to 
create that kind of mindset that, that if you want that culture, that online learning uh, can be effective and can actually be useful. Now, one of the first points here, I think, is to ensure that there is a diverse range of online tools. So um, something like a lecture, an, a two hour online lecture might work well for um, say a course in accounting where you need to explain how you uh, apply a particular formula. There is perhaps little point in taking a student by the hand and going through it step by step. At the same time, when you have um, a legal course, for instance, in uh, legal research or legal writing, individual guidance is vitally important. So what you ideally want to do is to have more tools than the simple, I can record my class online and then play it as a video for my students and then that should be sufficient because they actually will have the content. Now, Linked to that is that it's, it's great if we have a number of these tools, but perhaps even more important is for students and instructors to be aware of the vast range of resources that is actually out there. And that also goes for the, the well-established seasoned instructors. So I'll, I'll give you another example. When we were told in early March that we had to switch all our classes from face-to-face -to, -face to online within a week. One of the challenges is how to ensure that we have class participation. Because at SMU, this is graded, so we can't just say, well, we'll forget about it. Or as long as you log in, then we will count that as class participation and then that's it. So um, we then discovered that the university has uh, um, um, uh, licenses to offer, um, uh, uh, how do you call these, sort of, again, um, online systems like Kahoot or WooClap, and I'm, I'm happy to like later type this for those of you who are not yet familiar with this, which allows you to type a question on your slide or on your screen. Your students can see it, and they actually use their mobile phone. They enter the code, and they can click the answer or they can uh, so you can do this for multiple choice questions word clouds etc so it's a very good way to get students animated but we need to know that it exists now the other thing and this is something where i will i will be very frank and say that my own thinking about this has has evolved quite markedly is um, what on our side is called eptl it's emergency preparedness teaching and learning now, after Singapore uh, was confronted with the haze um, and schools had to shut in 2013, it was said, okay, at the university, we will mandate all instructors to teach one of their classes every single year online. And we do that to ensure that they practice with the various online tools that are available. Now, Many on our side didn't take this very seriously from the get-go. So some of my colleagues would go into the classroom with their laptop, do the class online when, while they were physically in the seminar room. So you could say they technically complied with the must check the online tools, but quite clearly that wasn't meant to be. At the same time, and I will say this here, because there was the requirement to do this, and this was actually checked by our IT department, and I'll say something about that in a second. It meant that when we had to switch, the switch was actually a lot smoother than for some of the other Singapore universities, where I heard some of my, my colleagues say they had never had to uh, conduct a class online and were not at all aware of how to do this. And any IT support would have to be provided from a distance because they were no longer able to come into the university. So having these sort of trials is actually really effective in the long run. That brings me to the fourth point, the importance of feedback mechanisms. By including in the regular uh, feedback that students need to fill out and that faculty need to submit for their annual appraisals, questions about the effectiveness of online learning, two things happen. 
On the one hand, instructors are reminded that they are evaluated on that basis. So this type of, you know, if you want carrot and stick thinking may motivate some of them to at the very least be prepared and be familiar. On the other hand, from the student perspective, we've realized that by asking questions along the lines of what went well with online learning and what suggestions would you have to improve online learning, we don't actually need to come up with all the solutions ourselves, but we hear directly from the students how we can make the online experience um, more attractive and more useful for them. Now, the final point here about cultivating the, the mindset, and, and I know that there is a question of resources here, but it's to make available uh, funding and awards. Now, the funding here doesn't need to be uh, huge sums of money, but having small grants available that faculty can apply for to test out um, online uh, uh, learning mechanisms. For instance, how can I transform a class where I need to teach um, the tort of negligence in an online fashion with games if I can get a small grant of, for instance, a thousand Singapore dollars, I might be motivated to apply for it, to actually do it. And once I've done it, I can share the results with my other colleagues within the law school and get them to realize that they too might be able to implement this within their own teaching as well. Now, if you say, well, resources um, are not readily available, then the easiest thing to do is to have an award for the teacher that has the most innovative technological approach. You do that, you give out one award, it can be a nice certificate. And at the same time, you ask this teacher or this group of teacher to share their best practices with everyone else. So there's, if you want, a lot of peer learning and peer sharing going on. Okay, next slide, please. Now, that links me, and I've already spoken a little bit uh, about this in, in, in the previous slide, the importance of having a university-wide infrastructure. And here I'll just mention three offices that I, I think are vitally important. One, well, every university will have an IT support office. It would be most helpful if within the IT office, you have specialists who are specifically equipped and tasked to support teaching and learning. So I'll go back to the example of WooClap that I mentioned earlier. Now I'll mention straight, WooClap is something that I had never heard of. But one of my colleagues who teaches research and writing has actually been using this and mentioned it to me. So I did some quick internet checking and thought, okay, this sounds quite interesting. Um, and I realized that the university had a license, but I wasn't quite sure how this worked. So I called up our IT department and said, well, would you be able to direct me to like a website or somewhere where I can find out more? They then said to me, we can actually do something better than that. One of our IT staff is a specialist in the use of WooClap. So she can come over to the School of Law and give a small training just for the law faculty members, for them to realize how this works, they can ask whatever questions they have, etc. Because we were able to trial it in a small session, it made it much easier for all of us to apply it. And from what I understood is that my colleagues who similarly attended this session have all used WooClap with the students in their feedback commenting on this as being really useful. Now, second, and that's the other question, if you want about resources. For law students, we often ask them to do a fair amount of reading of articles, books, but in particular of primary materials. And when students are able to come to campus, they can also come to the physical library and consult the physical volumes, the physical books that are there. But the moment the university itself closes, it means that students also no longer have access to these resources. So what that means is that ideally and going forward, libraries need to invest in creating an e-collection 
Yes, it's good if you have the hard copy. I mean, you can see the image of um, part of our SMU library behind me. Clearly, we still have hard copies on the shelf, but we've tried to invest as much as possible in having journals, books, statutes, case law, all of that available online. Now, secondly, what's crucially important for our students is to be able to find resources. And again, we normally expect that they go to the physical library and if need be, speak to one of the librarians who can then almost literally take them by the hand and walk them to the relevant shelf. But in a COVID situation, that can't happen. So what needs to be done is there need to be workshops on how you locate, and at least as important, how you evaluate online resources. Because this will be a skill that students need not only while they're still in university, but also once they go out into the legal profession, because at least in Singapore, most of the law firms are also still working remotely. Now the final, and I save this for last, because I think actually it's the most important, is to have a university center for teaching excellence. Um, we, we've had the, the, if you want, good fortune to have one of these at SMU. Um, so what the SMU center does is, and I, I took this from their own website, is that they engage, develop, and empower instructors to advance their teaching using evidence-based practices. Now, what that means is that there are a number of full-time staff who work at the center who do all their getting up on the latest pedagogical innovations, et cetera, et cetera. They then will collate these and they will share them with the different schools and try and tailor them to the needs of that particular school. Now, the themes that the Center for Teaching Excellence can work on, and, and I've again copied it here, is evolving practice. This is to help instructors to improve their current delivery of material. Integrating technology, so to come up with a form of blended learning. Educational research, so these are the grants I mentioned earlier. Uh, feedback, so this is done uh, after every single term. And then the Teaching Excellence Awards. Now to give you an example of the kind of workshops that um, are being held, um, I included these on the next slide. So as you can see in, in this month and next month, th these are some of the um, um, modules that the Center for Teaching Excellence is providing so that um, I and my colleagues don't need to think for ourselves, how am I going to, for instance, redesign my face-to-face -face class into an online lesson? I may already have ideas, but probably there's only so many good thoughts that I can come up with single-handedly. Um, similarly, how do I facilitate an online discussion? That's very important, but it's a skill. It's a very different skill from being able to do that in a face-to-face -face environment. So these are some of the, uh, the sessions that are being organized. And then on the final slide, I, I um, included what is currently on the web page. So after the COVID pandemic um, broke out here in Singapore, the Center for Teaching Excellence uh, added a microsite on online teaching. And yeah. this is what they have at present. So you can mm -hmm. see it takes you from getting ready for an online class uh, to actually conducting the class all the way to assessing it. Now, to the best of my knowledge, this should be a publicly available uh, place. I'm happy to share the link. When it comes to the specific tips and guides, I thought that might be better saved for the Q&A that we have later on so that I can try and share some practices that may be best suited for the, uh, the situation of the various Indonesian universities. So I'll end my, uh, my opening comments here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marcia. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting that SMU have a very excellent way in uh, dealing with a pandemic situation, employing 
uh, numerous of uh, innovation in digital learning. Well, uh, for the second speaker, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Kleisens to share his experience uh, at the Maastricht University Faculty of Law. Dr. Kleisens? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me as well. Um, shall I share my own screen with regards to the presentation or will you, will you? Um... Let me see. I can't, I can't share my own screen. In, in, in the meantime, apologies for any noise you might hear in the background. There's some renovation work going on in the building. So if you hear a jackhammer in the background, uh, that's not me, but <laughs> somewhere downstairs um, where people decided they wanted a new bathroom or something. All right. Ah, oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'll try to link in to to March's presentation as well. I made notes to see that we can that we can um, link this in together. I approached it a little bit different in that sense that I sort of um, give a, a a more chronological or historical. People who've worked with me before know that there was a historian lost on me somewhere. Um, I turned out to be be a lawyer, but it should have been a historian. So I'll try to do it in a, in a bit more chronological um, order and touch upon some of the points that Marge made as well um, with regards to more uh, sustainable or looking more towards the future. Um, a short overview of, of um, the Master's University Faculty of Law um, to characterize where we were. Um, when COVID-19 uh, broke out. Um, we we're one of the six faculties um, in Maastricht University. Uh, Maastricht University in total has about 18,000 students and about 4,000 staff. And we have 3,000 students um, combined over three bachelor programs, nine master programs, about uh, over 200 uh, staff members. So we, we're actually, one of the largest of the smaller fac uh, faculties. We have two um, huge faculties, the Faculty of uh, Health um, and Life Sciences um, uh, and the School of Business and Economics. Um, and then there are smaller faculties and the law faculty is among the bigger of these, these uh, smaller faculties. What is interesting and maybe atypical for a law faculty, uh, at least in the Netherlands, is that we have a very internationalized and diverse uh, uh, footprint. We have um, over our bachelor and our master programs, we teach to 70 plus different nationalities. Um, and that also came into play with, with, with the COVID-19 crisis. We use problem-based learning. Uh, so the, our core teaching node are small size tutorial groups uh, that also infrastructure wise, we use small rooms in the faculty to cater for these groups. So the idea is uh, that problem-based learning means that it is a teaching philosophy that um, feels that teaching should be first and foremost self-directed. So students are basically the problem owners of their own progress. And it, it offers teaching in what is called the three C's. Um, so that means that it should be constructive. So you build upon your knowledge as you go through a curriculum. So it's not sort of semi-detached modules, um, but it should be curriculum based with learning lines. It is contextual. So that means that it teaches um, the law or you learn the law in, in the, the same way it occurs in everyday life. So you don't sort of abstract into, into artificially divided areas of law, but it should be an overarched, integral, more holistic 
um, approach. And it is collaborative. So that means it's not an individual study exercise for the student, but they will have to work together um, with other students. That's basically the core teaching note. And we differentiate between, between uh, courses and skills trainings. And in skills trainings, we use a little bit larger groups where you focus on sort of practical skills that people need to have, writing, speaking, uh, those kind of things. And then we use sort of classical ex cathedra lectures uh, as a supporting teaching note. In, in, in true PBL, uh, in true hardcore PBL, lectures are superfluous and they shouldn't be there at all. And in the early days of the law faculty in the 1980s, there were no lectures and gradually they, they made their way into the teaching system that we had now. Um, it doesn't fit within PBL and PBL is used in the entire university. So that means that lecture halls are scarce. Uh, we have two small ones in our own faculty that cater for about, in normal situations, for about 70 to 90 people. Um, and there's a big one in the School of Business and Economics that caters for 700 people that we use uh, for larger cohorts as well. Our year is divided into six different course periods, and that's important for when COVID struck. Um, so there are four large course periods, um, on average running about two months. Uh, so from September to October, October to December, and there's a smaller one in January, uh, and then a fourth and a fifth large course period from February to April, from April to June, and then another smaller one uh, in June, July. And that's, so we, we have, a, a, if you look at the, the picture in the world, we have a rather long academic year that runs from September to mid-July, more or less, if you count, count all the resets and the things students need to do. Um, so that is where we were. Um, before COVID, just before COVID-19 broke out, 2020 has been an interesting year for Maastricht University. Um, to put it mildly, over the Christmas holidays, late December, early January, uh, the university was struck by a severe cyber attack, uh, which rendered much of the digital infrastructure um, useless for a couple of weeks. And then there was a very slow and gradual startup of, of online mechanisms. And that still wasn't completely um, dealt with when, when COVID-19 broke out. Also, interestingly enough, in late January, we had a meeting um, with all the vice deans and directors of studies in the Netherlands, of the law faculties in the Netherlands, in Groningen, uh, which is about as far away uh, in the Netherlands from Maastricht as you can get, um, and where the topic was online education. And the vice dean and I were there for, for Maastricht, and we sort of leaned back in our chairs and thought, well, this is not so much for us because PBL is very much relies very much on personal interaction and very much on meeting people um, and, and seeing other people. And beyond the odd recording of lectures, um, there was nothing really very much in our policy that strived towards online education or forms like that. Um, so far the irony, because then mm -hmm. February came along and um, in the south of the Netherlands, uh, somewhere in February, there is this thing called Carnival, uh, which is a Catholic feast uh, uh, marking the beginning of Lent, um, which runs until Easter. So we had this, this, um, this Carnival break in, in late February, early March, we came back to, to uh, the faculty. And obviously, COVID-19 was already going on. Um, there was obviously the outbreak in China, um, and we knew about that. And slowly but surely, news started coming in of another major outbreak in Italy. Um, and people who don't like to, to celebrate Carnival um, tend to go skiing um, in the Netherlands, uh, either in, in Austria or Switzerland or in northern Italy. Um, so that is how we probably got our first cases. So in, in late February, early March, the first cases um, came along, mostly in North Brabant, which is adjacent to Limburg, where Maastricht is situated. Um, and the number of cases gradually grew, but still that caught us off guard because on the 12th of March, on the 5th of March, we had a large uh, um, reception in the faculty 
that would be unthinkable now where there were over 100 people crammed in a little room saying goodbye to a colleague who left after many years. Um, on the day that Italy closed its borders for everybody. Um, and on the 12th of March, on a Thursday afternoon, the government had a press conference that said um, a lot of things, basically that everybody would have to more or less shelter in place as much as possible, but that also uh, there would be no uh, teaching activities for universities anymore. This was a, a press conference by the prime minister. There was some unclarity because the PM said lectures. There will be no lectures anymore as of Monday. And we didn't know what that meant uh, for our tutorials. So there was contact with the Ministry of Education. Uh, and the Friday, Friday the 13th of March, no coincidence there whatsoever, um, it became clear that there would be no teaching whatsoever, no physical teaching whatsoever um, as of that Monday. And by the time, um, and that is why I mentioned the year and how we, we, we fill in the year with different course periods. We were at the end, that Friday was the, the Friday of week five in a seven week course period where we would have exams in week eight. So we were very close to the, um, uh, the end of a course period, uh, two weeks left basically. And then in that third week, we would have exams over that entire course period. At that moment in time, there were 55 different courses um, ongoing. So that um, we entered what I called on the, on the sheet, the crisis phase, um, because over the course of a weekend um, where we had just said in late January that online education was interesting to view from a distance, but that it didn't fit well with the PBL thinking uh, in Maastricht, we would have to switch to um, online education within days. Um, we basically gathered um, physically still then on that Friday, um, we physically gathered uh, the course coordinators um, to tell them of this and that they would have to go online. And what we basically said is, is uh, we will support you in every way possible, but be creative and, and do whatever you think is necessary. Um, most of us used uh, a program called Collaborate Ultra, which was integrated in our learning management system, uh, which is still Blackboard. Um, we will transfer to another LMS uh, canvas um, as of August. So that was also something that was up for this year, a university-wide switch from learning management system. Um, and obviously in those early days, everybody started talking about Zoom. Um, and, and obviously within weeks, we also had a university-wide license for Zoom and people switched to Zoom. Collaborate is basically the same. Uh, all these programs um, do essentially the same thing. But we asked people to be creative. We, so we saw everything over that weekend. We saw people live streaming over YouTube. We saw people uh, going on more advanced gaming platforms because obviously we also have colleagues who like to game in their, in their scarce free time. Uh, so things that I didn't even know existed, things like Twitch or Discord channels were opened up. Um, so we really relied on the flexibility of staff over that weekend. By that Monday, and I'm still extremely proud of that, by that Monday we were up. We were up and running, we were open, there was teaching, uh, people had tutorials online. Lectures were either live streamed in a synchronous form or were recorded um, either in, in longer sessions or in, in what we call knowledge clips. And I might later on towards the end of my presentation touch upon that, that idea of knowledge clips um, as a replacement for lectures um, at the end. The other pressing problem we have at that moment were exams. Uh, so we had three weeks until exams were, were um, organized. And normally speaking, we, we, are, we were quite traditional in exams. That meant that most of these 55 courses would have a final uh, written exam. And we use a conference center for that in Maastricht where we put people by the hundreds there's also different faculties by the hundreds in a big conference hall um, to have them write their exam there. Um, very old fashioned, actually, uh, not on computers, but hundreds and hundreds and exams. Um, that obviously couldn't take place anymore. So, so we had to find something there. 
so we asked course coordinators to to change their exam forms to take home exam um, that meant that they would be open book that meant that they could use all resources both online and offline uh, that they uh, could uh, could use at that point in time there was no discussion with regards to proctoring nobody knew anything about digital proctoring or how to to um, to deal with that um, so we asked course coordinators to transform their exams to to focus on the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy so to basically um, not go for reproduction so not go for questions where the literal answer could be found in literature for example or in case law uh, but to go to higher levels so to to application um, basically give them problems that they would have to solve luckily within the PBL method that is basically what you look for anyway so these these changes were with many people marginal and we introduced um, because obviously from an exam point of view, there are weaknesses in that. You are not 100% certain that whatever is handed in, uh, you can check for plagiarism, of course, and you can check whether it's copied, but you're not 100% sure that what is handed in is actually written by that student. Um, so we had them sign a, a, um, a piece of paper, a, a statement basically saying, this is mine and I will face dire consequences if it is found out that it is not mine with the idea that everybody with a functioning conscience um, would think twice about uh, committing fraud, basically, uh, if they would do other things. As a director of studies, on a, on a curriculum level, I was okay with this, uh, and the Board of Examiner was also okay with this, because I believe that over the course of a curriculum, even if you would have a point of uh, exam points where somebody was not 100% fair or an exam would not go the way you would plan or you would have to declare it invalid or whatever, would not say anything about the value of this person's uh, degree in the end. So that means that in the end, the question that you need to ask is, is did somebody earn their degree um, that doesn't stand or fall with one exam that would be weaker than what you would normally be used to. Um, we also took a, a, a quite a, a far-reaching executive decision. I, I said we have 70 plus different nationalities. These people were in Maastricht and these people got concerned calls from home and these people learned in the news in the Netherlands that more and more countries were closing their borders. So very quickly, we, we as a university took an executive decision. Uh, the government wasn't that far yet. And we said, we do no more physical teaching during the remainder of the academic year. So until the end of August, there will be no more physical teaching. There will also be no more exams. Uh, if you want to go home, please go home. Um, luckily, everybody made it home. I've heard about interesting stories of people who managed to take last minute military flights back to uh, wherever they, they came from. Uh, but in the end, we got everybody home safe and sound. Um, and that was very, very important for us as well. But we knew at that point in time there was no going back. We couldn't ask our students to come back during the remainder of that academic year. And that's still something we're struggling with now as to towards the future. What, what are we going to do in September up until January? Um, as I said, I was very proud of how the faculty reacted. Staff was flexible, students were flexible. Of course, we also asked in, in, um, in student evaluations, our normal evaluation system was still offline because of the, the cyber attack. So we used Qualtrics. We had to improvise on a lot of things. Um, we used Qualtrics to, to ask people how they felt, both staff and students, how they felt towards the switch online. And generally, this was very well received. And people helped each other. I mean, there's a very, there's, there's generational differences in staff. Obviously, uh, there's also differences when it comes to tax savviness, uh, unrelated to, to generations or age. Uh, and we, we had very helpful staff helping each other in order to make this happen. Students volunteering to help staff to make, to make things happen. So, so that, that actually showed that in a time of crisis, um, the the whole community as as uh, a whole would draw together 
the more sort of consolidation phase came after that. So we had the last two weeks of that course. We had that first exam period. We survived. We would go into the next period, the, the, the next larger period, period five from, from April till June. And then a smaller one where mostly skills trainings take place uh, in June, July now. And we also had pro the, the additional problem that came up is that a lot of our staff um, has small children still. Schools were obviously closed, childcare were closed. So people were also asked to basically run a homeschool in addition to also just putting their hours in uh, while working. So we, we, we were very uh, well aware of the fact that there was huge increased work pressure. We asked people to go on and, and Quite some of the people in course period five were also the course people who worked in course period four um, and who would have to do this all over again. So at that point in time, the faculty board decided to have two models, a largely synchronous model that, that we was dubbed in, in the pro model. So we would use more uh, online resources but that actually is closer to what we would normally do. So students would be on a schedule. They would have tutorials once or twice a week. They would have a lecture on their schedule a week and they would enjoy that online, obviously, but still live. And there was an asynchronous model that provided for a lot of recording to be done. So to record knowledge transfer in the form of knowledge clips, to even have uh, a selection of students do an online tutorial which would then be recorded and would put, be put online for other students uh, and then also Q&A sessions either in the form of a live session where you would have somebody through Zoom or Collaborate Ultra talk to people or an offline discussion session to use the discussion board as was used by Blackboard. And this was dubbed the light model and we found out afterwards that there was nothing light about it because it because it was so far detached from what we normally do, it was actually more work for staff uh, involved. And students weren't that happy about this light model and we learned that they actually care about uh, having these online tutorials, even though it, it cannot replace uh, them meeting physically, um, they still very much valued the fact that they could talk online. Even though we notice as staff that what being online means for a lot of students is switching their camera and their microphone off uh, and you basically trying to organize an interactive group session between uh, 15 um, squares where you only have the name in white and then hopefully something going on in the chat box rather than actual participation. Um, so there was some friction there and that is what you get in the post-crisis phase. So that, that sort of, uh, uh, we all get together, very supportive, very flexible sort of um, attitude that, that we had in that earlier crisis phase. Whenever that crisis dies, or the immediate crisis dies down and actually persists in what seemed to be at that time an endless more or less lockdown uh, where people would be sitting talking to their laptops all day. Uh, that creates additional work pressure. That creates also what we have been calling Zoom fatigue um, now. Uh, so you get more friction back and forth. The staff, students, there's more uh, of a, a you know, the, the tolerance levels sort of go down or are used up. And that is something that we had to work with and that we can work with. I mean, it's still, it's not problematic, but it's still something that we had to take in it into account. Uh, by now we are at the end of that course period five and well into course period six. Um, and luckily the figures, COVID wise, the figures are looking better. Um, outbreak seems to be under control for a couple of weeks already now. And um, we are actually, as of yesterday, we know that as of next week, as of the 1st of July, whatever we had, whether that was a lockdown or not, uh, it practically ends. So a lot of these measures end now in the Netherlands. Um, the only measure that is kept in place is social distancing. So, and in the Netherlands, it's a meter and a half. Uh, it differs all over the world. Sometimes it's two meters or six feet or a meter, or, but it's a meter and a half in the Netherlands. Um, that means that for the new academic year, we, the, the university has applied this idea of on-site where possible, online for those who cannot be present. Um, 
So that means that as of September 31st of August, actually uh, that Monday, we will uh, start to teach uh, in physical situations again. But there's a lot of as, ifs and buts there. Um, because obviously social distancing rules will still be enforced. That means that there will have to be, you will have to have a meter and a half distance. What this practically <laughs> means, there's also some more additional rules on being able to ventilate the rooms that you use, um, the, the air flows, those kind of things, all kind of technical stuff that I don't know about. What it boils down to is that we can put one person on seven square meters. And for our tutorial rooms, that means that we normally work with groups of 15 or 19 students. Um, you can have five students and a tutor present in a tutorial room. Um, so that either means a lot more tutorials. Uh, if you would divide those people where you normally have 15 or 20 um, in a group to, to either make three or four groups out of that. We don't have that staff capacity to make that happen. We don't have room capacity to make that happen. Uh, so we go for a hybrid model. Um, which, which is by far, uh, it's, it's far away from an ideal model. But what this basically means is that you have people in your tutorial rooms, uh, and, but that you also have infrastructure in, in your tutorial rooms. So, so a large screen, a large smart screen, uh, and a good conference camera and a good spider <laughs> conference microphone on the table somewhere uh, where the others that are normally also supposed to be in that group can participate online. And that is something that we are working with now. Um, we are looking at very much on clarity at the moment because we have no idea how many people will show up uh, as of August. We are asking people whether they want to come to Maastricht. The overwhelming answer to that question seems to be yes, we want to come to Maastricht, but wanting is not equal to actually being able to. Um, for quite a long time and only yesterday night, we, we sort of uh, know that probably this won't be the case for national students, but we had rules in public transports that students could only use public transportation um, after 11 o'clock in the morning and before three o'clock in the afternoon, um, which would render teaching um, almost useless if people have to come from quite far away. Maastricht, uh, well, if you looked at a map of the Netherlands, Maastricht is not exactly in the center of the Netherlands. So that means if people travel from places in the Netherlands to Maastricht, that takes quite a long time. And obviously for international students, uh, the, the, the whole idea of flight travel will probably not be like it was before the crisis for a very long time. And questions of financial ability also start uh, to pop up then. Are people still able to afford a plane ticket if it is three, four times the price that it was before uh, this whole COVID crisis? which would link into, but I think that's more for, for Q&A uh, or for another discussion, the danger that we try to avoid at all costs, obviously, uh, of social divides into studying. Um, so that's the hybrid model we're going to. Exams will still be online. And I said online unless, and then three dots, uh, unless somebody higher up, so the Ministry uh, of Education or the university might take a decision that we have to go back uh, to, to on-site examinations, um, which is possible. If you look at the conference center, um, we, we, normally, um, we normally hire one hall. They have three or four. Uh, that could also be a possibility that you put people there with, with one person per seven square meters. You would need a whole lot of more square meters there. We have those. So that could be a possibility that somebody higher up says, okay, we are going to move away from online exams because of these weaknesses that I indicated. Um, to end my presentation, looking briefly into the future, um, I, think, I think that um, we have learned uh, quite a lot in a short amount of time um, and that some of these things will probably stick. Also, um, after this COVID-19 crisis ends, after there is a vaccine maybe, and after we can return to some sort of normal situation afterwards. And what I'm looking at for our PBL situation is most notably that position of lectures. Cohorts were growing. We had more and more trouble to fit entire cohorts into lecture halls anyway. We noticed that there is a generational difference. Um, 18, 19-year-olds that we have now 
but also 20, 21 year old master students have problems um, having an attention span of two hours where they have to sit and listen to somebody talking, uh, lecturing. And there are different ways of, and I was actually myself uh, experimenting with knowledge clips. And I know that Alt Willem Hieringer has been using knowledge clips for years in his courses uh, to, to add to or to even replace actual lectures. I had them replace actual lectures in my course uh, just before COVID broke out. And that was actually ideal. Um, so I see the teacher of the future, the law teacher of the future, also having um, literacy in knowing how to record, um, knowing how to make interesting online content, knowing how to edit maybe a little bit. So there's a whole different skill set that comes up. And I support Marcia in saying that's, that's um, probably university-wide support of these things is something that is extremely important. And there's an infrastructure side to that. That means buying stuff. Uh, like everybody else in the world, I think the university also dived on good webcams, good microphones, good, I mean, this stuff is sold out all over the world. Um, so everybody has been doing this. Um, but also to, to invest in people who know what they're doing and can teach people actually how to, to, to do these things. Um, the danger is indeed, I don't know if I'm, but that is also the position that I'm in, Marcia, as a director of studies in a law faculty. Um, I also tend to, to be quite weary of centralization um, by the university if it is not extremely necessary. So what we do is we share best and worst practices between the six faculties. Um, but I think I would find it not flexible enough if I would have a central university agency that would sort of instruct us how things would need to be done. Um, I wish we had emergency preparedness teaching systems. <laughs> we didn't have those here in the, uh, in the Netherlands. Okay, I think that sort of ends the things that I wanted to say, and I'm obviously interested in, in, in the Q&A sessions and see what questions people might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kleisens, for sharing uh, your experience uh, at the uh, Faculty of Law, Mastery University. Now, it is very interesting that uh, uh, lecturers uh, at uh, Mastery University needs to adapt in a very short time with the pandemic situation. Now, uh, for the third speaker, I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Airlangga, Ibu Dr. Uh, Ibu Nurul Bariza, PhD, uh, to share her experience um, at the Faculty of Law, Universitas Airlangga, teaching law at the pandemic uh, situation. Uh, please, Ibu Nurul Bariza. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, also, good morning uh, to my colleague in the Netherlands. Uh, first of all, I would like to say Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and I would like also to say hello to all my college and rebel friends and the law faculty of law skin from various faculty of law in Indonesia who are joining this forum. Welcome and thank you for joining. I also uh, would like to welcome uh, all legal scholars and uh, my colleagues and uh, I know there are some of uh, my uh, beloved students also join this. Uh, I would like also thank to uh, Professor Mar Marcia and uh, Professor uh, Kleisen uh, for very excellent uh, presentation. I'm sorry I did not make a you know, PowerPoint presentation as uh, in, in the last few days, I was busy from one web webinar to another webinar. And that is the impact of COVID-19. So uh, I, I, I found difficult to me to manage my time, honestly, to make a short uh, PowerPoint presentation for this afternoon. Um, as two of the part, no, as two of the 
presenter uh, ready uh, introduce uh, their law school. Actually, I don't want to introduce a school of law or faculty of law Universitas Erlangga here because uh, I know that all of our colleagues who join this um, seminar are from Indonesia and all of them already know and recognize that a faculty of law is one of the best. I mean, Faculty of Law, Universitas Erlangga is one of the best faculties of law in Indonesia. But I would like uh, to introduce to uh, Professor Marche and Professor uh, Kreisen. Uh, I don't know whether you already come to uh, Surabaya or not. Uh, uh, yes, that's why you need to come uh, after the uh, pandemic. Uh, we ended up if we enter into the new normal or after after we back to normal yeah um uh, faculty of law universitas erlangga is located in surabaya surabaya is one of the uh, good city in indonesia it's not only in indonesia but uh, in the asia pacific region or something like that you can see in the youtube and in the context of universitas erlangga um, and Faculty of Law, well, University of Langa is a uh, sit on the five top university in Indonesia, and uh, because two of the universities don't have Faculty of Law, so Faculty of Law sit on the third position in Indonesia, uh, according to national rankings, and uh, we do have a hundred lectures and uh, seventy five uh, staff academic academic staff, and we has a uh, to, to 2,500 students consisting of Bachelor of Law, Master of Law, Master of Public Notary, and PhD of Law. Before I talk about how legal education affect uh, by COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as the topic on and the title of this seminar, uh, what is the disadvantage and also the opportunities and challenges especially in the context of uh, digital learning for legal education, I uh, would like to flashback a little bit uh, discussing about the state of development of legal education before COVID-19 pandemic spreading throughout the globe. Uh, if we remember that uh, we have discussed, we have been discussing the position of legal education in the digital age as impact of fourth industrial revolution, in which my, many legal profession lawyer are replaced by smart robot and artificial intelligence, and the role of big data for storing huge of document, and consequently we change our curriculum and expected learning outcome facing these challenges. And uh, you know that uh, changing the curriculum is not easy task. Uh, we have to struggle to change that uh, curriculum to face with the digitalization of legal education. Uh, so uh, before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we are facing the decade of digital revolution which has transformed so much our world, and of course, transform legal education as well. Then we have preparing to enter into digitalization of legal education, as legal profession has already digitalized. Law offices are now uh, paperless and using cloud-based practice, majority of them. We have to predict that uh, digital production and distribution of the course material will powerfully affect both the content and the way we are used in the classroom and library. And we have been entering into transformation era before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that uh, the problem probably in the context of Indonesia, uh, uh, when we are facing the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, quite different with uh, what already talked by uh, Dr. Marche uh, from a perspective of uh, SMU University because when we uh, see her presentation uh, about uh, how best the infrastructure uh, in the SMU 
So we have to think and consider uh, from the perspective of Indonesia that uh, actually I want to say we have a spirit, we have ambition, but you know the fact our uh, condition in the context of uh, infrastructure, I'm not saying poor, yeah, it's not good for saying poor, but I'm saying that less sophisticated, probably like that. Uh, I read a book uh, before things the or before I just uh, I made redesign curriculum uh, before the COVID pandemic uh, spreading uh, through the globe. Uh, the book that are uh, wrote by Professor Edward Rubin uh, entitled "Legal Education in Digital Age." The book uh, was uh, uh, published in 2012. Uh, Professor Rabin is um, professor of law and political science for Vanderbilt University. Uh, he discussed how digital material will create and how they will change concept of authorship as well as method of production and distribution. And we explore the impact of digital material on law classes and law libraries. We consider the potential transformation of what we call is curriculum that uh, digital material are likely to produce. Uh, and through this book, uh, he provides uh, momentous change that every law lecture and score, I think, uh, is good to read. But uh, honestly, that I'm not representing the publisher, but uh, I'm happy to read this book because uh, I think uh, it is very important for a dean like me. And uh, because of that, uh, fortunately, that after pandemic spread due to the curriculum change and the technological transformation, we have required all courses have uh, to 10% teaching using online media before the pandemic happened. Because of that, some teachers are already accustomed to teaching online, but most of them are not familiar enough. So we need to provide courses to all lecture about uh, how to teach uh, online teaching. Although we are also not expect that they will be technologically proficient, but they have to mastering varieties of model on online teaching. We do also has the center of teaching excellence, like what uh, uh, University of uh, Singapore Management University has, and we do also have like a coach in every faculty that responsible and helping uh, to assist all lectures are dealing with the problem uh, to deliver material through online teaching in many varieties of ways. Then, in the last 10 months, we are entering into the COVID pandemic and what the pandemic has mean and will mean to the legal education. The answer is clear to me, this COVID-19 speed up the digitalization of legal education, despite its advantage, it can be seen as opportunity and challenges as well, like the topic of this seminar. Now, uh, let's discuss about disadvantage and what is the disadvantage of this COVID-19. So, uh, I would like to talk in the context of Indonesian legal education and in the context of uh, Indonesian local situation. The university decided to close in the last three and a half months, but close in the meaning of physical activities at campus. Teaching and learning processes must go on. This means that we move our operation online and since then, we have used various variations of online teaching techniques and format. What it means by the student and how about student life? That is the crucial issues in Indonesia. Of course, the life of many students across the country have been disrupted, with most of them returning to their family homes. It seems for the next semester and for the rest of this academic life. At the same time, uh, 
lectures exploring new options for online teaching, but we also understand that many problems arising ranging from lack of face-to-face -face contact to the technical issues. Many lecturers comment and protest that traditional ways of teaching cannot be replaced with online. The context of quality, for example, although it is still debatable until now, they are good that during traditional class teaching, they can contact uh, they can contact and contact the student directly. They can uh, ask the student directly. Can control the class. Can be implement student uh, center learning uh, easily. And lecturer can see the student one by one. Uh, can see their gesture. Lecturer can see the seriousness of the student. As this can be also used as a parameter to evaluate the student class participation. Still in the context of Indonesia, if many students might adapt easily to online learning, considering must be given to the accessibility of remote working, in particular for those from this advanced background, and uh, for example, students with dis disability. For many such students, on the top of the forced disruption to their study, there will be further issue for them to consider. They might find that unlike their peers, they don't have stable internet connection and also hindering that hindering their participation in the online classes and even impacting their ability to sit their exam. Particularly students from affected family with COVID-19 pandemic in which their parents lost their job, their parent, their parent business must close due to the COVID-19. Uh, they face the very, very terrible situation. And uh, so the problem is, as uh, Pak Radian mentioned, lack of infrastructure, lack of digital uh, infrastructure is still exists in Indonesia. And disparities between one, uh, uh, what we call island to another also very very huge. In the con still in the context of Indonesia, probably uh, this case is uh, different to Singapore and even it's different to what is happened in the Netherlands. Access to suitable laptop is also uh, cannot be taken into granted. The student might have really upon their university and uh, local libraries to access this device and will now find themselves having somehow managed without their facilities. This is uh, very, you know that, uh, very annoying and it is unsurprisingly if during this pandemic some student still come to cafe uh, because uh, last time when I did um, what we call a survey to our student, uh, those who are did not back home and stay in Surabaya, uh, we see some student uh, at night in the morning and uh, at noon uh, uh, sit down in the cafe, open the laptop and uh, the, the issue is because the speed of the internet in the cafe is faster than at home. In addition, uh, without a rebel and stable working environment, the scope of the stress seems clear, while access to counseling staff is also uneasy and not always available. So in this context, we need to also understand that not every home has a space for students to walk in. And some students might find themselves working or even sitting remote in remote uh, area for examination. Uh, for example, in bedroom, and they have to share with their sibling or in a busy communal areas. With all but uh, essential public space being closed, it means that the student cannot access places which is open, could have provided them with the facilities that they need as an alternative for them. This situation created tension where different members are struggling to complete work same as a very real problem. So like me, for example, uh, like me, for example, 
uh, all my daughter are uh, studying at home and uh, sometimes they have problem and I, I should also working uh, at home with a, a different uh, what we call is a duty so it make uh, me complicated when they ask me to do something uh, and annoying me. Uh, in this context, legal education courses are generally highly intellectual demanding and quite uh, space for learning is essential, but for some in this current crisis, this will be an easy to achieve. So then, what is the biggest challenges? The first is technological capacity and proficiency. Not all lectures firstly adjust with development of technology. That's the big issue. And not all lectures able to teach online. Then we need to provide assistance and special training regularly to all the lecturers so they can use all the technology available and experience new pedagogies in online teaching and learning processes. Secondly, there are some courses that cannot be conducted online, particularly courses related to practice cannot be done online. Thus, there is some teaching course must be postponed like moving court, legal clinic, legal skill, lawyering, and some course will be conducted when we enter into the new normal. The exam of staff courses uh, in, the, in the semester are postponed. So uh, it will conducted when the, we are entering into the normal. So, uh, so such exam is pending while outside law school, the court has already implemented a court. It means what? It means that you are still left behind to some extent. Thirdly, Pro degree also require a law faculty to give more practical exposure to students than mere spooky knowledge. As the students who are studying law currently will be in the courtroom as soon as possible when they graduate. We are facing challenges dealing with internship course. Since many of law firm, government office, parliament office, institution, agency, court are still work from home and with limited access to enter. Considering the fact we are also postponing internship course. In Indonesia, we have internship course. We do have like, uh, what we call is community service uh, course for students. If the student are uh, unable to complete this uh, course, they cannot uh, graduate from the faculty of law. This course is impossible to be conducted during this semester and thus we must offer alternative model that can be evaluated as equivalent to what we call is KKN, Community Service Program or Kuliah Kerja Nyata. Uh, furthermore, all exam and evaluation are conducted online, so we need to adjust the type and model of exam that we already set up in the, our curriculum and in the, our expected learning outcome. We need to create a type of evaluation and exam which give biggest possibility to our student able to do without uh, difficulties. We have to ensure that even though they are stay in the remote area, it can be accessed well. Then uh, uh, probably uh, my time is limited. I just uh, talk a little bit about the opportunity. Uh, this pandemic increased international uh, solidarity and cooperation work hand in hand in aspect of our life, not only in the facing international public health emergency, but in education as well. It means that during this pandemic, the world become closer and closer. We can see this opportunity to set up a new platform for cooperation and partnership, I mean, in a cost-effective space. Many of our partners offering their hand to give public lectures online, and uh, believe me, that this trend will continue when we enter into new normal or enter into the condition of normal. We have inviting many of our partner universities from Malaysia, Australia, Netherlands, and many others to give public lecture to our students. Uh, the trend of webinar sharing can also use to complete the online teaching material and can also enrich uh, knowledge to our students. Next semester, we enter into the new normal condition, but given the condition of Surabaya, which 
still being unsafe, so the number of uh, positive COVID-19 in Surabaya is still increasing from day to day. It is very unlikely that we will ask students to attend class. The degree from the Minister of Higher Education and now from our rector already state uh, that uh, uh, we are using online teaching and learning until the end of this, uh, until the end of the uh, next semester or the end of uh, this year. Uh, it is hoped that in the next semester, innovation of lecture learning by using online media will be more sophisticated, more advanced, and more varied, more attractive to the student. Lecture and student uh, are more familiar with the classes on online media and of course student more satisfied. Uh, to conclude uh, my presentation, I would like to say that a COVID-19 pandemic has already changed the mode of teaching and learning and uh, phase of our local education from conventional one to the alternative mode of teaching by using technology. By doing this automatically and coincidentally, we are already moved into what we call smart campus, digitalization of all aspects of our academic life and activities, e-learning, e-administration, and e-payment. This in line with the main task of the modern university, which prepare future lawyers, is the combination of humanitarian and technological knowledge and skill, as well as the development of student skill in working with modern technical means. Of future lawyers, Learning of future lawyer must wear a systematic nature of the application. Graduate uh, of law school should be obedient to qualify a specific legal situation, receiving the necessary information from a variety of sources, electronic plan, which implies a level of mastery of the material. This profit. Uh, sorry, Ibu Nurul, I think we lost your voice connection. Could you please unmute it? Oh, yeah? Yes, um, all right. Yes, we okay. can hear you now. Okay, and uh, you know that this COVID-19 has fit up a digitalization of local education, and I believe that this digitalization of all aspects of academic life and administration will continue after the end of the pandemic. In Indonesia, we have to implement what we call is Merdeka Belajar. That is a new term uh, given, uh, introduced by our new Ministry of Education. What the meaning of Merdeka Belajar is freedom of learning. And uh, also, uh, our Ministry introduced what we call Campus Merdeka. What is the meaning of Campus Merdeka in English? It's a free campus? I think not, yeah? I don't know. The the good term uh, for this merdeka it, it, campus not free words. Free so the idea campus. is no no no, but merdeka belajar we can uh, we can interpret it into freedom of learning, but uh, campus merdeka is not freedom of campus yeah it's different, but uh, the meaning that uh, free campus is no yeah freedom of campus is or not uh, probably Bunilam know well how to uh, interpret. A Campus Merdeka in English term. <laughs> Although the character of legal education is to provide a practical competency for students to be future lawyer as professional lawyer, in which some of the practical thing cannot be conducted online, digital competency is a must. Next semester, we implement the hybrid model uh, between. Um, Oh, next semester is not hybrid model. All is through online until um, February next year. But after February, we implement hybrid model. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Ibu Nurul Bariza, for sharing your experience as well as Indonesian experience uh, uh, in digital learning in the era of a pandemic, particularly the uh, legal education. Now, 
Bapak Ibu sekalian, we are now in question and answer sessions and I can see that some of you, some of the participants has already submitted some question through the chat room. Now, uh, I would like to choose some of the questions. Um, a question from Bapak Joko Ismono asked to Dr. Klesens. Bapak Joko Ismono asked whether the study regarding the court's judgments is implemented in Maastricht University and how do you uh, study uh, uh, precedence in the uh, pandemic uh, situation like this? Uh, Dr. Klaassen, you can start uh, answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, th that's a very interesting question. Um, I saw it in the chat already. So I've been thinking about uh, the answer uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, and in essence, obviously, this is not a question that relates to COVID, uh, the COVID crisis as such. Um, it is what we try to do in the PBL system is, is to use, obviously, being a civil law jurisdiction, and there's no binding rule of precedent um, with regards to case law, but obviously, uh, the case law is still very important in interpretation of, of legal rules. Um, but we try to take it for what these cases are, uh, namely tools, as to, to get to a, uh, an answer. So, so we don't study case law per se, uh, but case law is an instrument in getting to the solution of a problem. So if, if certain case law is necessary, to solve a particular legal problem that the students are faced with, then obviously they would have to study um, this, this case law. And early on in their undergraduate education, they will learn the, spe the specifics of reading uh, specific court cases from different courts and what, what their own uh, different traits are. So what the difference is between, uh, or how do you read a, a um, a case, a ruling from, from uh, the Hoge Raad, eh, the, the, the Supreme Court in the Netherlands. Um, how do you read a court case from the European Court of Justice, from the European Court of Human Rights? Um, so, so they learn that, but that's sort of the, the technical aspect for where do I have to look for? Um, but then we don't start, we, we don't give a focus to studying case law as, as a means. It, it, it is an end to a mean, uh, no, it's a mean to an end, sorry. It's, a, it's the other way around. Still early, um, so it's a tool basically, and and le learning how to deal with case law is part of the tool chest that students need to have in order to be good to be good law students. So we approach that more from from a skill uh, perspective than from sort of taking case law and and studying that as a, as a separate. It, it's integral to to the problems and the legal solutions they are dealing with. Um, and that's how we approach that in, in, um, in PBL. Later on in their studies, we expect them to find relevant case law themselves. Early on, um, we tend to sort of help them in the right direction where we would say, okay, it could be helpful if you looked at this and that in that case, uh, because that might give you uh, insights in how to deal with this, uh, in how to deal with this problem. Okay. That, that would be my answer at this point. Okay, thank you, Dr. Klassen. Now, uh, we have the second question, uh, but this one is not particularly addressing Dr. Klassen or uh, uh, Ibu Nurul or the other uh, speakers, but uh, now I would like to give an opportunity to Ibu Maria Ulfa. Ibu Maria Ulfa asked a question to Ibu Nurul Bariza. Uh, how the system of online examination in the Faculty of Law of Universitas Erlanga for undergraduate students before the pandemic happened, it, uh, how, how it Con how it was conducted before the pandemic happened and after the pandemic happened. Ibu Nuru? Okay, thank you very much uh, for your excellent question. Uh, I think in the context of uh, online uh, exams, yeah, 
and also evaluation for students. Before the pandemic, uh, uh, we do regularly, normally. Uh, there also uh, depend on the what we call is the course. If the course use, uh, I mean, in the course uh, type is like practical, so uh, like a mood court or something like that. So they have to practice and establish a court or something like that. Yeah, uh, and uh, there are also like um, what we call um, sending a paper. Uh, take home exam or critical and analytical thinking sitting in the class exam uh, many type of uh, and uh, some of the uh, exam also just uh, like um, asking uh, the lecture asking directly uh, like in when we defend for our uh, or something like that in front of the lecture so uh, it depends on the expected learning outcome. Uh, it depends on the, um, the teaching, uh, I mean, uh, uh, curriculum uh, teaching uh, document. Uh, with, uh, because uh, uh, in that uh, teaching document, it all already mentioned. Uh, what we call is teaching document is like curriculum document or before we enter into the uh, class, usually uh, lecture give information, the type of um, exam, uh, it consists of mid exam and uh, uh, what we call final exam and consists of presentation uh, and soft skill and etc. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, that is normal and uh, uh, mostly similar to uh, the rest of the university or school of law. And then after we enter into the COVID-19, so we have to uh, redesign uh, the evaluation of student in the context of exam, uh, we, uh, we already uh, did last, what we call is ujian akhir semester or uh, last semester, final semester exam. And uh, all uh, was conducted online, as I told in my presentation, that uh, the only practical exam that cannot be conducted online, we have waiting to enter into new normal for that. Uh, and uh, every course has different type uh, of exam. It depends on the, uh, I mean, the agreement between the team of uh, teachers who are teaching the subject. Some of them uh, send um, what we call a paper. I mean, we give uh, like um, announcement earlier uh, to our student that the exam must be in the uh, writing an article or something like that. And uh, to, to avoid what we call like a plagiarism on just copy pasting uh, uh, from uh, another resources in the internet, we have to explain to our student that uh, we going to check uh, all the exam to uh, what we call plagiarism uh, test like Turnitin or something like that so that the student think twice before they uh, uh, did a subtype of like academic uh, what we call is academic uh, crime yeah is uh, plagiarism is academic crime so uh, that is the one way that we can do. And also there are also another type of uh, teaching by, you know, by using online directly communicate, uh, not teaching, another way of uh, examining the student uh, by uh, direct uh, communication with, uh, uh, with uh, lecture online. Of course, all is with the, uh, without weaknesses because we cannot uh, see uh, who is the next uh, side of the, uh, the student or something like that, but uh, this, uh, because we don't have a technologies, we're able to monitor uh, uh, the surrounding of uh, the student uh, that usually attach in the computer on, uh, in the laptop. Uh, but, Thank you, Guru. Yeah, yeah. Very good. That's enough, yeah? 
Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Um, now I can I can see that two participants already raised their hands on the chat. Now I would like to give an opportunity to uh, Bapak Jordan Gunawan. Could you please turn on your microphone and ask directly your questions to the speakers? Bapak Jordan Gunawan. Okay, Bapak Jordan Gunawan. Okay, he is not here. Now I would like to give an opportunity to Ibu Febiola Presilawati. Ibu Febiola. Ibu Febiola, you can turn on or unmute. Yes. Hello. You Asking question? Yes, Bapak Jordan Gunawan. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just back from the uh, restroom. Sorry. Okay, so thank you very much. My name is, uh, I, I just opened the video. Um, my name is Jordan from Universitas Mode Jakarta. So um, actually, I just want to, uh, what is that, deliver my questions to Bu Nurul Bariz also, but a little bit also already ex explain about, about these questions from her. Um, so just wondering on how Singapore Management University and also Maastricht University uh, can handle the skill practical knowledge through this online system. Say like we have a criminal procedure or civil procedure that usually the student need to go to the moot court room for having these practical things. Then they have to face to face in room working together in making proceedings and they could like imagine that they are the real judge and also lawyers and attorney so how you could anticipate and manage these things as well. And I think this is also the challenge for uh, uh, Universitas Erlanga since the ministry doesn't allow us to have the offline system. So I would like to deliver this inquiry to uh, three of those um, speakers. Thank you. Okay, uh, the first opportunity to answer, I would like to give it to uh, Dr. Marcia. Dr. Marcia? Of course. So I, I think that that, if you want, is uh, on the one hand, one of the most important skills to teach. And it's the one that is most difficult to teach in an online world. So I've seen some of the other questions and they focus on the important topic of how do we create, um, if you want, an exciting and informative online experience. But when it comes to skills, I think that we need to accept that we cannot fully replicate these in an online environment. Now, if you want, what can be done? Now, when it comes to, for instance, mooting and legal clinics, we have actually been conducting these um, online at SMU. So one of the ways in which this can be done is that a number of the online systems that can be used, so Zoom has it, uh, we use WebEx quite a bit, they have breakout rooms. So that is where you can have a small, you know, if you want almost face-to-face -face discussion with your students where you could guide them through a specific uh, problem. Now, perhaps um, more relevant when it comes to the written portion is to use Google Docs. So we use Google Docs as a, as a shared version uh, quite a lot for group projects as well. Now, the advantage is that you can see what each student types. And that also allows you to get a good sense of which students are truly understanding the material and which are the ones who are struggling and, and you can tell they either are not contributing at all, so they're disengaged, or they have a knowledge gap there. So if you want the Google Docs works. Now the other thing what some of my colleagues have been doing is to try and have almost multiple windows open on their uh, screen when they share it. One where they would have for instance, the legal provision that you're dealing with, or in the case of, if you want economics, the formula to apply. And then they have another screen where they can basically do the writing, uh, the typing, the underlining. That's where they will put the example so that the students can on the one hand see what is being taught, and on the other hand, how this is meant to be applied. Now, at the same time, and, and I think that this is something that has come up in, in I think Shurt has, has mentioned this as well. 
this is, if you want, at best a proxy. I don't think that when it comes to, to the skills-based courses, that a fully online learning experience or even blended is what we should be aiming for. That means that once it once again becomes possible to meet face to face, I would think that these are the type of classes you would want to resume first. Everything else in a way can, can, can be put on the back burner. Thank you, Dr. Marche. Uh, now the second uh, opportunity to answer, I would like to give it to uh, Dr. Kleissens. Thank you. I can, I can be brief. I wholeheartedly agree with Matt. We, we do these online as well. So we have in, in both the, the, um, the Dutch law undergrad course as in the European law school, we have moot court trainings. Um, we have been doing them online, uh, more or less also hidden behind the fact that, that court cases in the Netherlands now also take place largely online. Um, but this is what Marty says, this is a proxy. And it's actually the same as what I've seen and, and participated in over the last couple of months, a PhD defenses, for example, that we also do through Zoom. Uh, it works, uh, yeah, people defend their PhD, uh, they get it in the end, uh, but it is, not, it is not similar to what uh, you would normally have and the, the whole experience of being there. And that is obviously also the case with moot court trainings, that the whole experience where we have a fully outfitted moot court room, which is basically, a, that looks like a courtroom uh, where students put on their robes, where they feel sort of the pressure of actually doing this. You can't simulate that in a Zoom session. Uh, so that brings its all entire dynamic. So we're doing this mostly also for reasons that, that we have avoided postponing subjects as much as possible. So everything has gone on, but that is a less than ideal form. Um, and I would agree that, that you go back there ASAP uh, to, to uh, normal human interaction um, that you would need in order to fully portray this. Thank you, Thanks. Dr. Klaassen. Yeah, now Ibu Nurul Bariza. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Jordan, for your uh, good um, questions in the context of uh, Mood court, uh, honestly, and uh, the fact uh, tell me that um, we has in Indonesia e court, electronic uh, uh, court, and I mean online court, yeah, and uh, it has been also uh, implemented in many courts in Indonesia, and uh, when we come into discussion uh, with our colleague who are teaching uh, who are in the team teaching on um, mooting uh, uh, and also uh, teaching in a criminal procedure uh, civil procedure as well as administrative procedure uh, they uh, reach conclusion that it is uneasy to examine the competency of the student by using online online meeting. Uh, they're still uh, thinking uh, to postpone the method of exam, uh, the exam, just only the exam, not the training. Uh, just only to postpone the exam, probably uh, the pandemic is getting uh, stopped soon. We expect that the pandemic getting stopped soon, so that after that, we uh, just open uh, um, make open examination to the to those who are take uh, moot court, civil procedure, criminal procedure, administrative procedure, or all technical uh, courts. Uh, I talked to them uh, and discuss about this issue and said that why don't we? Because uh, you know that uh, we are enter into the digitalization and we have. Uh, to able to do it and uh, what is the answer is that uh, uh, the impression face impression gesture uh, for muting are completely different they said like what uh, and in Indonesia 
even we have a court, but uh, the judge, uh, the persecutor, uh, witnesses, the lawyer, and the administration of a uh, person who are helping a uh, judge should also come together in one room, In uh, I mean in the court. It's just only conducted through online without uh, uh, many uh, people see the court. Uh, they they see the court uh, through uh, electronic mean or something like that. So uh, that why I thought that we are left behind this. Uh, but I believe that if this COVID pandemic is not going to yeah. stop, uh, so we cannot make the student disadvantage for this. Students should get a mark, uh, should get uh, should evaluate. So the only way that we can do is uh, by uh, online procedure, by uh, probably a meeting or something like that. Because we can do it in all the form of thesis, dissertation, and scription. We do all examination uh, are through online. But only in this case, uh, in the context of civil procedure, criminal procedure, and administrative procedure, we still not using this uh, type of uh, uh, online online exam to to of some reason that I already mentioned. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu Nurul Bariza. Now I would like to give an opportunity for another questions. Uh, I can see that among the participants, there is one person raising hand, Dr. Andin Rusmini. Dr. Andin Rusmini, uh, could you please unmute your microphone and ask directly your question to the speakers. Only one speaker, please, because we have limited time. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon all. Uh, I have a question about the now we we know uh i uh we must do for daring daring for the lecture uh how about your opinion with the we uh learning with the animation graphics uh because uh daring is is very boring for lecture or <laughs> yes very boring for lecture or uh to student Maybe, uh, can you be opinion? Thank you. Uh, to whom your question is? Uh, all. Kepada siapa? All, all, Satu all. saja. Satu saja. Uh, maybe, uh, so, so, say. I can wait the, the name. Merci. Siapa? Merci. Oh, okay. Uh, to Dr. Marcia. Um, yeah. Dr. Marcia, I would like to clarify the questions um, in English. Uh, she actually asked about um, the use of the graphic animation in teaching um, during this uh, pandemic uh, situation. And, um, and she also mentioned about uh, that studying online sometimes is boring and uh, mm -hmm. I can see that perhaps uh, uh, because usually students are in interact interaction uh, directly with other students. Uh, could you please uh, share your opinion regarding this, uh, Dr. Marcia? Of course, and thank you. I think that that's a very relevant question that uh, I don't think any of us has found the answer to as yet. So we're, we're muddling through at best. So I think if you want, one of the things that helps the most is to try and cut up the existing, if you want class, lecture, whatever you have it, into smaller chunks. So I think almost the gravest mistake we can make, and it's the most tempting one, is to say, I used to go to class for two hours with this slide deck. I'll now put myself in front of the laptop and I'll pretend as if it's the same as always. It isn't. I tell my students, when we watch a two hour Netflix movie, we already tune out and Netflix is supposed to be fun. So, you know, don't expect our students to do the same thing. So one of the things that you can do is to say, let's invest in either looking for good short videos. For instance, TED Talks are often great in getting students animated. Or, and I think that this is something that sure might, if, if time allows, speak on, these knowledge clips. So try and have some of these videos to break up the pace a little bit. 
And then for instance, to say, look, let's have an exercise with the students. Perhaps have a little bit of class discussion and the, for the class discussion, try and use these online tools that you have and preferably ones that use their phone because telling students they can't look at their phone during you know, th this entire seminar, it's not gonna happen. But if you tell them you need to look at your phone because there's a question coming up and you can see who has participated, that incentivizes them uh, uh, to if you want to do this already. Now then, and, and I think that that's the final point I'll say here and it links back to another question I saw in the chat, which is how can we help students adjust? And I think what is crucially important here is to basically manage their expectations and to guide them. So where before they would just walk into a lecture hall, sit down and think, okay, let's see what happens, that's not realistic. So preferably, I think all of us need to send an email to the students before class to say, okay, this week, this is the topic. You need to watch these two videos. We'll talk about, for instance, this assignment. Uh, we will have a, uh, an online discussion about topic X that we'll do at this point. It's a little bit more work, but the optimist in me thinks this is something that could then be sustainable as we move back to face-to-face -to -face teaching and actually enhance the quality of education. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marcia de Fisser. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Sorry? Oh, okay. Now, um, the last session, the last part of uh, question and answer sessions, I would like to give an opportunity to the speakers, uh, each one of you, to perhaps you can read from the chat room that there are some interesting questions asked to you but you don't have time to answer that on the chat room uh, you can answer it directly now now i will i will give an opportunity first to dr uh, Kaisen, uh to uh -huh. highlight a question and answer it Dr. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I looked at the chat. Uh, there, there's a um, there's a couple of things we we uh, addressed already, and obviously, my apologies, but I obviously could only um, look at the questions in English. So I trust uh, I trust you uh, if there's if there's questions that I need to answer uh, in Baha Indonesia, then I hope you will you will translate them uh, for me. Um, there was one specific question I can be very short on, on, on uh, registrations for next year. They're up. And actually, this frightens us a little bit. Um, we would have expected them to not be up, uh, but they're up and by quite a bit. Um, and we don't really have a good explanation for that in these times of uncertainty. Um, that means that we, I think for bachelor students, uh, we are up 15% uh, uh, of last year uh, at this point in time, and for masters, it's even more. Um, that might be something here in Europe. Obviously, that that has fallen to the background with the whole COVID-19 crisis. Might be an outcome of Brexit. Uh, people who would normally would look to study European citizens who would normally look to study in the United Kingdom uh, and would refrain from that now because the United Kingdom has left the uh, the European Union. That might be one of the explanations. So our numbers are up. Um, I, I have no, that is, that is um, a good thing from this crisis is that now we still have things online in September because this would have made me very nervous uh, room-wise uh, and space-wise and staff-wise if we would not have the COVID crisis and we would have to deal with these kind of numbers in, in September. Um, other interesting, I answered the case law question. Um, we talked about adjusting. Um, so, so I'll take the very small parts with regards to the knowledge clips. I think that's that the future of lecturing, yes, it's true what Marge said, two hours of online lecturing, you shouldn't do that as a lecturer and you shouldn't do that to your students. Um, so if you are looking for knowledge transfer in your lectures, um, then work with these knowledge clips that can be, well, specialists tell me they shouldn't be longer than a couple of minutes. I have some that are close up to half an hour, which then would be too long. Um, but I tend to use a lot of words to, to, to get where I need to be. Um, 
And that is something that's, that is also detached from COVID. That might be the future because we are obviously dealing with a generation that is called the digital natives. These people grew up literally with a phone uh, in their hand, um, at least here, and who are unable, COVID or not, online or not, who are unable, um, and you can have a judgment on that, on whether that it's good or not, but it's the, the reality, who are unable to have an attention span of two hours and to distill uh, yeah. the, the structure from what somebody is telling them um, from that, where we could do that. When I studied in the 90s, we had to do that and I could do that, but we were from a different generation um, and, and these kids just can't do that. And then we can be angry and say they should be, uh, or you can, you can adapt to that and think, well, we need to find a different mechanism. And then audio video, so knowledge clips, that is, that's close to where they are. Uh, watching Netflix or, or looking at their phone. So to keep it close to, to what they're used to and what is their, their sort of natural state of being. Uh, with regards to participation, to link it to, to the last question I had, I have the impression that, that interacting digitally is closer to their natural state of being than actually interacting in, in, in face to face. Because Masha might still remember she thought with us as well when when I give a break to it when I gave a break to a tutorial group in the late 90s early 2000s they would talk about their weekends and what they would have done and they would interact socially and if you give a break now to students they take out their phones uh, and they go and update their Facebook profile or something and they say I'm in a boring I'm in a boring tutorial and they don't talk to other people you know, they talk to other people online through their phones um, so so I have not I, I personally have not problems in having them interact um, because that seemed that seemed to feel more natural for them than sitting in a room where they had to actually speak up and talk um, so that's 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 the impression of the questions that I had uh, yeah. if there were more then then please let me know yeah that's fine uh, now uh, dr. Marcia de Fieser, do you like to highlight some questions and uh, answer it Yes, of course. So thank you very much for, for giving me this opportunity again. Um, I'll just make a few brief comments. Um, one of the points that was mentioned earlier was about the question, access to laptops, internet speed, no place in your home to study. This is actually something that we've encountered with a number of our students as well. Uh, I mean, you know, Singapore is very densely populated. Um, we've, we've had the same situation where some of our students were saying, look, I would have to do my studying and, and sit for my exam at the kitchen table with half the other, the rest of the household uh, going about their business. That actually will affect my ability to um, perform well. So I think here we have a real question of equality. Now, what the university has done, and they've, they've discussed this with the Ministry of Education, is to say, despite the country by then, by the time of our exams being in a quasi lockdown, are we able to allow a small selected group of students who are in, in actual need to come to campus where we can provide at the very least a room for them sit, to sit for their exam? Um, so permission was granted for that. So I think here, if you want, we, we need to think compassionately that we, we have this, this reality. How can we mitigate it? Now, one possibility is to do this at the point of exam. I think the other is to try and move away from only a final exam or a final exam in the, you need to sit for one or two hours and that is the make or break for your particular course. So especially for, for instance, theoretical courses or applied courses saying, well, perhaps we ask students to write a final essay, for instance, we give them more time. That means they're not so dependent on whether their internet connection holds at one, per, at one given day. Um, we could ask them, for instance, to do something with group work and here either rely on Google Docs or some other form. Um, in terms of getting them engaged, and that links me to, if you want the point about boredom again, um, one option is to say, well, if we ask them to do something as a group, ask them to come up with um, a knowledge clip or, or if you want a vlog of some sort and share that with their peers. So our students seem to get all excited about these sort of things. Now, the final point I'll briefly make is that about the emotional relationships. 
So um, that, of course, is important. It's, it's easiest for students that we have taught before. Um, we know them and we can, we can either tell when they are struggling or we can count on them to reach out to us and indicate that they're struggling. But how about the new students or the year one students or the shire students who, who have a little bit more hesitance in this regard? Now, I don't think that there's, if you want, much more we can do than to make ourselves available. And I think that that's important because when we normally enter a classroom, we will engage in some social chats. So we'll come in, we'll say hi to students, we'll do the same thing during the break and after class. But when we move to an online environment, it's very tempting to forget about that and to straight away start and say, okay, this is the topic today. And then after class to say, this is it, bye, you know, goodbye, log out. So what I found, so my students were, were initially very unsettled by all the rapid changes. So I started every class by saying, okay, guys, I know that there's another policy that has come out. Is there anything you want to say about that or ask me about this? Um, you don't have to, but I just want to check in with you. And I noticed that that helped students to feel more comfortable and to reach out when they were having that difficulty. Now, the other option, and this is something that some of my colleagues have done, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of implementing that next term when we start teaching again, is they would have online office hours where they say, I make myself available on Zoom or WebEx or what have you. On these hours, anyone who wants to can just pop in, can clarify a question, you know, raise any issue. And that too seems to have helped precisely because as Short mentioned, sometimes the Shire students are more comfortable in a virtual environment where they don't actually have to be in the same room with you physically. So I, I think that there's ways to go about it. And I think the plea that I would make here is that we all need to be very mindful of the importance of investing in these emotional relationships as this COVID pandemic drags on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marcia. Now, um, the last opportunity, Ibu Nurul, but because we have very limited time, could you please uh, just limit your time like only two minutes, Ibu Nurul? Ibu Nurul? Okay, that's good idea uh, for answering uh, in short persuasive. Uh, yeah. I just pick up the question from Pak Faisal. Uh, the question is, do the change of the curriculum exist among school of laws to deal with the COVID-19? Uh, uh, at the Faculty of Law, Universitas Erlanga, actually, we don't want to change the curriculum uh, because the only uh, a uh, change that we made during the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic is the method of teaching and also the method of exam. And uh, we, uh, there is no change in the expected learning outcome. Expected learning outcome and uh, all the, I mean, syllabus, all the material uh, and all the everything like um, what we call is uh, what we call is uh, what what we call a metric of uh, metric of learning. Uh, we have not uh, changed such uh, type of a document, but uh, uh, method of teaching and method of learning is part of a curriculum document. But we are not changing this uh, uh, this because of COVID nineteen. Uh, but we are going to change this curriculum uh, to adjust with a new idea, new notion that promote by Ministry of uh, Education uh, about uh, Campus Merdeka and uh, Merdeka Belajar. What we call uh, how to interpret in English? I did not found uh, the right uh, term. Uh, campus Merdeka mean independent campus, probably. Uh, because Merdeka is freedom or independence. See? Campus Merdeka in the meaning that we give the opportunity for uh, one of the one of the characteristic uh, that already uh, promote by Ministry of Education is that um, student can do internship program uh, during uh, their time at the university for 
uh, three semesters. Uh, from one semester until three semester. So they have to uh, uh, out from campus in the meaning that they can uh, uh, do internship in uh, another part uh, of a government agency or in, uh, in the court or in um, many, many uh, work uh, places that is uh, able to uh, provide the possibility for them to enrich their knowledge uh, in the practicing of law or something like that. So they have to uh, go outside the campus and that opportunity is given until uh, three semester. So how we can, uh, I mean, uh, adjust this with a, a new, uh, in our new, uh, in our what we call is a last curriculum. It is still difficult on how to account it because when the student do uh, according to the rule uh, that already set up by Ministry of Education, when the student doing internship for four months, it can be equivalent with uh, 24 credit uh, semesters. So how to account this? That is the big challenges for us that why we uh, going to change this curriculum uh, is not only uh, because of uh, COVID-19, uh, in which in the COVID-19 we just only change the method of teaching, but uh, the rector also insists us to change because we, when we are going to enter into the new normal and also in the normal situation in the next years, we have to do hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, what we call is a hybrid uh, learning processes uh, so that uh, even um, we has the opportunity to teach on class but uh, the director said that uh, we should not teach in class but uh, we just uh, we need to uh, do 50% uh, for teaching online and 50% for uh, like a conventional teaching uh, in class. So uh, because of this, uh, we have to change our curriculum. Uh, the idea for this is because we're going to implement a smart campus, all uh, shall be digitalized. That's the idea behind the, what we call is a redesign of curriculum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Nurul. Now, before uh, I conclude this event, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Sasha Hart to give uh, his highlights on our talks today. Dr. Sasha Hart. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much to every uh, participant and uh, especially to our three speakers this morning uh, for these very, very insightful remarks. I've learned a lot. In light of time, I'm not going to try to summarize what has been said. I think that's also uh, not necessary since I couldn't add very much. Let me instead just make one uh, observation which has uh, struck me throughout. Um, and that is that, first of all, we all face this, obviously, the, uh, the same difficulties when, when switching to uh, online teaching and online learning. Um, and while there is this, this idea that we are under a huge pressure to innovate, uh, there is a danger that this innovation uh, in terms of technology can actually lead to a type of regression uh, in terms of uh, the, the way how we teach. If we're not very careful, um, this technological innovation uh, makes us move back to more frontal teaching, more lectures, us talking, students listening, writing things down, students reproducing in exams rather than engaging in discussion because this online teaching and learning environment has a tendency to isolate us huh? um, as was uh, as more compatible with a more traditional um, uh, way of teaching and learning. So what I've learned today, and, and this is also, I think, uh, the experience of, of basically everyone who has had to engage in this, this switch to online teaching and learning, um, is that the key to success, however you do it uh, technology-wise, 
is to actually be more collaborative, more communicative, more interactive, to, to try to actually facilitate um, students to collaborate amongst themselves, but also encourage students to communicate with us even more um, than they did in the physical environment. Um, so we, we do good indeed, and we have learned this, Stuart has, has given this, this very interesting example from, from our own faculty, uh, by moving from this light uh, e-teaching model to the more pro e-teaching model because the light e-teaching model wasn't appreciated as much and was actually more work also for staff doing the asynchronous pre-recorded less personal and less interactive uh, method. So we learned from this that if we want to make e-teaching a success and actually an enrichment um, for the teaching that we do, we have to find ways and I think most of us are doing a very good job in, in this already, um, to make this communicative and, and interactive. Um, this is what I have taken away from today. There were many, many uh, examples of good practices. I think this was a very valuable uh, exchange. I'm definitely going to follow up also the many cues and, and links that uh, Marty uh, is giving us uh, and has been talking about. Uh, and I leave today with, or actually I don't leave, I, I stay today um, um, with a lot of new ideas and, and new inspiration for, uh, for online teaching and, and encouragement, because I'm also one of those who are suffering from Zoom fatigue and so on. But there are ways to make this interactive and communicative. Um, so thank you very much for this exchange this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sasha Hart. Now, um, for the closing, I would like to invite uh, Professor Heringa, the director of LEAP OKP from Maastricht University, uh, to give his closing remarks. Professor Heringa? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, well, as uh, Sasha Hart already said, it uh, has been a very rich uh, meeting today. I'd like to thank all three speakers for their wonderful contributions and what they shared with us. Uh, what I sort of take from this, this session is, uh, well, that Zoom sessions can be very rich. Uh, it's very lengthy to sit behind the screen for two and a half hours. But uh, what we all do is sort of, uh, we take all, we want all the messages we want to convey and compress them and convey them very quickly. So it, it becomes very rich. Uh, this, se this session is in fact shorter than w uh, did we have to meet in person. And then we had long lengthy sessions and now we, only save a lot of time by not traveling. So that is one of the things we can take home from all these Zoom sessions. We get square eyes maybe, but it's still, it, I think it's very useful. However, there's a couple of things I like to sort of underline because I think they are very important. That is the, what uh, Maatje de Visa mentioned about library facilities. Uh, I would say that that is highly important to underline that the library facilitates students to uh, 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 to be able to study. Secondly, to train expertise, to train staff. We as staff, we are simply not equipped to suddenly go to, to all kind of digital learning. That's not what we have done in the past. It's probably something we must do more in the future. Uh, so let's train our staff. Uh, I want to be trained in it. I know WOOC Lab. I have worked with similar fora, but still I'm not an expert to take it to the, to the next level. I'm not in gaming, uh, so, but I think it's, it's good for us staff to train staff because what we don't want to happen, I think, uh, and digital teaching will stay with us, I'm convinced. What we don't want to do is simply copy paste our present day physical teaching or our last year physical teaching into digital training by simply uh, recording lectures, uh, recording what else we did and, and taping exams and making students do it the way we did. No, I think we have to change. Uh, one of the experience uh, I had with it was by, by changing my exam in, in, in April into a take home exam. Uh, and then I thought, what do you want to take home exam to be? You cannot ask students questions they learn from the books because they can look them up at home in the book or on the internet. So the, what you have to do in the exam is to take applications. So you must give them cases and you must, then it's simply they cannot find a solution on the internet. But it also leads to having to change the content of courses. It means we have to reflect on how to integrate digital aspects into what we teach in a course. So it's not simply 
putting digital aspects in how we teach a course, but it is about reflecting on what do we want in our course? How can digital aspects aid us in that? And I believe that knowledge clips, I called them, uh, I gave it different names, but the function is still the same, is you convey knowledge to students. Students can listen to the clip, they can watch the clip whenever they like, they can rewatch. If they don't understand, they do it again. They can do it at night, they can do it at times when they want to learn. And it, my experience in Maastricht has sort of showed me that students spend more time in, uh, to a course when they have this kind of small clips they can listen to whenever they like, they can listen to it. And it's much more effective than a two hour uh, lecture. So I think those experiences we can learn from, I think it's very good to have uh, uh, maybe emergency trainings in faculties and universities to build also centers of expertise, to exchange expertise, because what we're doing now, that can be done on the Indonesian level uh, where Indonesian law schools and universities uh, exchange websites, exchange experience. Let's be open about it, how we do it. That is the only thing we can improve what we do. And full-time digital legal education is not perfect. It is maybe a partially inhuman. We cannot expect human people only to interact to, through the computer. But if it is the only possibility to continue legal education during these times, then that's the best we can do. So let's make the best out of it. Uh, but let's also try to work out uh, for the future and build courses for students about digitalizations, do the same for staff, maybe build courses on uh, e-mooting and build an e-moot courts in various universities, eh? because it's not unlikely that in the future, more court proceedings in the future might take place through video. Uh, so let's prepare our students for it. Let's prepare them also for doing interns, internships partly through the internet. They can still write papers for their new boss through the internet. And, uh, so why not continue with those aspects? Uh, will it be perfect? No, but the future is maybe not perfect as well. And let's prepare our students for uh, th that future as well. And that is partly digital and e-learning and e-working. So thank you very much for all your expertise and sharing experiences with us. I think we, this, these meetings are meetings to be continued. Uh, on national levels, international levels, but within Indonesia, the Netherlands and uh, Singapore and also among us. Thank you so much. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Professor Heringa. That was an excellent closing remark. Bapak Ibu Skalian, we are all at the at the end of this meeting, at the end of this talk, thank you for your participations. Uh, thank you to uh, the speakers all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Marcia, Dr. Klesens, uh, Ibu Nurul Bariza, and also to all participants who already participate, asking questions and uh, joining uh, this uh, talk series. And now we have already uh, give you polls. If you have time, you can uh, uh, answer the polls. Uh, and uh, I already shared you the result of the polls uh, at your screens. Yes, uh, most of you are giving, uh, uh, say that uh, the quality of today's talk series is excellent. And thank you. Uh, according to you, I'm an excellent uh, moderator, 68% saying that. And how is the quality of the speakers? 91% said that the speakers are excellent. Okay, thank you very much. And I will see you on our next talk series. Bye.